Hey, this is Taman. This is Bulmus. And you're listening to the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John and Pete. This is John from the Break It Down Show. And this is Brenna from the Break It Down Show. Say what? Brenna's yeah, here? Yeah, Brenna's in the house. Yeah, Brenna's Surprise. The house. You know who else is in the house? Who? Bull Moose. Bull Moose. Bull Moose. Georgia Zone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, so this is an episode produced by the lovely Brenna Turner. That's me. Uh, she brought us a great young emerging band called Bull Moose. And, and where are you guys out of? Um, we're currently out of Evans, but we're kind of scattered around Georgia, Augusta area. All right, cool. And so what kind of music do you guys play? We like to call it this kind of progressive grunge. I take from the kind of like the 90s era, I'm really into Nirvana, Soundgarden especially. The other three are into sort of an assortment of things. It all kind of just comes together and toward, uh, to kind of a pretty hard rock and alternative rock sound. That's where the goodness happens. Oh, yeah. How did you find your voice in the early 90s? You guys are uh, you guys are kids born in the late 90s. I was, um, I'm the second oldest. I'm 20. I was born in 95. And a lot of the music that I grew up listening to, um, especially from video games, a lot of like Alice in Chains, Soundgarden. I remember it was ATV off of Fury like two or three or four I listened to that stuff like as I was a kid and then as I got older I listened to it on the radio and then I started playing music and I guess it's just what I sort of take to now it's funny how video games have changed the musical landscape because I can say the same for what ties my musical taste together with my kids because my boys play Madden and you know they play masculine songs on the soundtrack of Madden and some of them are you know, timeless classic. So there are things that we have in common because of that. So that's cool. I'm I'm really fascinated by that influence. Uh, it's like something to think of it. They're like Tony Hawk Underground Games. I don't know if, um, if you guys have ever heard about those, but they have a really great soundtrack. And um, some of the covers that we've actually done are um, from, I think, uh, the Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4. We, we did a cover of uh, Shimmy by System of a Down. Nice. Yeah. And that was the song. Yeah, a song I brought up to the guys because uh, I've always wanted to play it. Play it. Taman uh, is really good with the metal drums, and that's why I was hoping that we'd be able to pull it off, and we were able to. But if you were a, a kid from your guys' era and you wanted to learn about Iron Maiden, well, shoot, Tony Hawk was going to teach you about him. And then he was going to have, here's MWA, and then there was going to be ACDC. And then, you know, it, he just had such a great mix on those, especially three and four for me, were really good soundtracks. They all had their own place, but you were going to get punk, you were going to get classic rock, you were going to get something modern, you were going to get all kinds of things that really were cool. So I, I dig hearing that you guys got your musical education in that fashion. Yeah, and of course you got a lot of guitar hero and stuff like that. I was a pretty antisocial uh, middle schooler, so I just sat there and I played uh, Tony Hawk. Uh, the Tony Hawk games and uh, Guitar Hero 3, World Tour, all that jazz. Anti-social middle schooler, that doesn't I'll make for a good musician. <laughs> 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 Taman, you rock pretty hard, huh? Yeah, man, uh, I love playing drums. Yeah? Who, tell us some of your influences. Honestly, I was kind of like searching for like, my musical taste because growing up, you know, I listened to a lot of rap music and stuff through middle school, and it wasn't until about eighth grade that I picked up my first mainstream metal track, and it was actually like an Abyss Subfold song. And then I got my first drum set when I was in my junior year, and I just kind of took over from there. Right on. So, what were you listening to once you got a hold of a drum set and you decided, like, oh, this is me right here. I found my, I found my thing. What, what were you listening to at the time that was informing your your playing and your development? Oh. Um, I listened to a lot of like modern day drummers like Luke Holland and guys like that. They were like doing a lot of like metal stuff, but it wasn't just like blast beats and like beating the crap out all over the kid. Like I like spin through metal, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like so, like I pretty much just like listened to stuff and tried to do it on the kid, whether it sounded good or not. Right, right. No, that's uh, that's respectable because that allows a lot of influence to come in from all over the place. And you know what ends up happening is you end up playing like you anyway. So whatever your influences were, you know, sure you're gonna take chops from there, but you know, your your feel is your feel. I listened to a lot of Green Day. Trey Cool is a really cool drummer. Yeah. And for a punk drummer, he's a real groove drummer too. Definitely. Kyle, what do you do? Uh, I play rhythm guitar. And where do you get your influence from? I got my influence from Van Halen, honestly, first and foremost. That was the first 
really hard rock band that I ever got into. I drew a lot of influence from trying to emulate as best as I can Eddie Van Halen style for a while. Um, <laughs> That's a lot, of no yeah. a lot of respect in that statement. Man, man. no as, kidding. As best as I can. Yeah. Not only that, um, but you're gonna like learn a lot of shit doing that. Yeah, and you just spoke oh, yeah. to about eight billion guitarists that come before you. You know, I mean, everybody picks up that thing and goes, "I wonder if I can sound like Eddie." And That's some people person. put it back down. They go, "Oh, nope, nope, I can't. I can't put, do put it that away." <laughs> so thank you for yes. persevering, man. I'm glad you stuck it out. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Do you still listen to a lot of Ed now? Not as much as I did uh, when I first got into him. Yeah. Uh, there's still definitely something to listen to. Uh, probably like a few times a week, definitely. A lot of the early stuff, especially, gets me really pumped up. Like what? Uh, some of their less popular songs. Um, from their first album, there's a song called "On Fire." Oh and man, yeah, "On Fire" is good. It's an amazing song. There's an amazing guitar solo in that song. I um, find if you're gonna be a rock bassist, you gotta learn "On Fire" too. Oh yeah, you gotta get that Michael Anthony sound, you know. Yeah. What else? Uh. Listen to some 90s stuff, kind of like Marissa, Nirvana, Soundgarden, really heavy into Rage Against the Machine. Yeah. Uh, we're actually going to be planning on doing a cover of Bomb Track here. Oh, yeah. Soon, so we're really looking forward for that. That's good stuff. Oh, yeah. Something with a good rhythm to it, you know? Yeah. You can't beat it. So have you always been, I mean, I know, you know, you can't be into the guitar and listen to Eddie and, and not fall in love and, you know, with, with all that work. Whether you're a rhythm or a lead player, because he's, you know, course is a killing lead player but as a rhythm guitarist man if you just break down what he's doing he had to hold down all of the guitar when they played live so he's he doesn't get a whole lot of uh, props for being as good a rhythm player as he really is definitely not when you listen to music nowadays who's got your attention as far as the guitar uh really it just depends on the song honestly i've been really listening to this band called wolf alice they got their really own unique guitar sound as well. Um, they have the same kind of setup with a rhythm and a lead. And really, it just depends on the song, you know, whichever guitar part. What's the name of, of the band? With. What's the name of the band again? Uh, the band is called Wolf Alice. Oh, I had that in my elbow at one time. <laughs> and I had to get it flushed out. It was really bad. It was really bad. It's it's sm- been ended it after. smelled awful. Oh, God. Yeah. It's part of getting old, Dad. I know. I'm ancient. So, okay, what about what about older influences? You guys are going pretty pretty far back to Van Halen and stuff. Does anything from the early seventies, sixties, fifties, forties, any of that any of that stuff speak to y'all at all or no? Uh I am actually pretty into the Who. Actually recently went through a Who stage. I actually love voice or cult too, so the seventies seventies rock is one of my favorites. Um and our lead guitarist Dave, who can't can't be here with us right now, he is he takes a lot of influence from the seventies. And even a lot of uh, the funk and disco in some cases. First of all, Marissa is a true. Dave is not here. Let's talk about Dave. <laughs> Since oh, he's not yes, here. let's talk about Dave. Yeah. Uh, Dave is a scapegoat. <laughs> when, when something's wrong, we blame Dave. But he, he's, a, he's a great person and an incredible guitarist. Our band recently has gone through a lot of changes. Like at the turn, turn of the year, uh, the year uh, in January, we lost our original drummer, Luca, from some, I guess, musical differences. Um, and we had a falling out, and then we found Damon, and we were with Damon for a while, and then we, and then Kyle found um, me on Facebook, Kyle was like, hey, you guys, you know, looking for another guitarist, and I'm like, you know what we've been thinking about that? So Kyle showed up, and we were just like, yeah, this is happening. We've been doing pretty well ever since. So Damon came in, folded right in, the guy who left, whatever his name was. Fuck. Yeah, moved Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 right on. So, what are you guys looking forward to? You got a summer? You got summer booked up, or do you got have appearances that you're making uh, coming up in the next couple months? Oh yeah, we've actually. I've actually today. I've gotten two gig offers. One of them on top of the gig we already had, and another one. A friend of mine in Columbia, South Carolina, is asking if uh, we'd be able to come out and play a show. That's right now, we got I think about five five lined up. That, that's awesome. And you know, we've talked to people that have made a career in music and one of the things we find is that they reach a certain point where the scale has tipped and they think to themselves yeah i, I can legitimately make a real living doing this have you guys hit that point yet do you think or you i still would say to they hit out? a point where they say i can't do anything else well yeah that was the next part of that question yeah, is is hey, can you do anything can you go back now can you go sit can you go to wife saber and sling ham hocks you know anymore 
They don't sell ham hocks, Dad. Oh, sorry. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> ham hocks, black eyed peas. Listen, so let's take that question in two parts. The first part is have you guys hit a point where you go, well, this is how we make our money. That's it. I'm not thinking about mowing lawns. I'm not thinking about, you know, whatever else one does to make money. Oh, hell no. I don't think. Uh, this day and age, uh, it, 20, 30 years ago would have been easier. I'll say that much. Around here in Augusta, they're not they're not going to pay you a lot because people don't really show up at shows. And um, Taman and I actually go to college, too. Uh, he holds down a job. I hold down a summer job. Basically, at this point, um, we don't really make any money from it. It's a sort of a hobby and an outlet, but we're hoping to make it into something more than that. That is a very pragmatic view, and I appreciate that, because a lot of people get caught in a trap when they don't have pragmatism in their approach to making music. If you love making music, please continue making music. At some point, hopefully it catches on and you go, well, I can't afford not to do this anymore because it's kind of overtaken this day job that I had and that would be great and that's what we wish for you guys but in the meantime you gotta do what you gotta do you gotta eat brother yeah. gotta eat you know what I mean so and, and you guys are following a very good path there's a guy who maybe you've heard of haven't heard of but his name's Positive K this guy has one really strong song that has allowed him to make different choices in life that allow him to be more artistic he was like the third black guy on MTV yeah and he has this really cool song really really well known it's called I Got a Man Anyhow, he said, we asked him, what a young artist, what, are, what should they do? And he said, stay in school, get an education, build your music career around your education. So when you have to be in the studio till three in the morning, that's what you do. And when music breaks for you, then you're good. And if it doesn't break, then you're good. The other thing that's really, really good news for you guys is there is a very well-worn path coming out of Athens, GA for bands that go to the Hall of Fame. No kidding. I mean, it's not a problem there. You and guys. bands that aren't afraid to reach far and wide for influence. Yeah, yeah. So you guys are, your, your trail's been cut for you in a lot of ways. It might have some overgrown weeds on it and everything, but that that's not a problem for young people like you to go out and say, we, you know, we, we can beat that brush back. So don't, don't need, in any way be discouraged by that. How far is Columbia, South Carolina from you guys? Um, I want to say maybe two hours. That's not bad. Mm-mm. No. Now, it might be more worth it, though, if you booked two or three shows in a row and made a weekend out of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I babysit and kind of nanny full-time, and that's uh, the, uh, one of the weeks that I have off. They're going on vacation somewhere else, and you're heading up <laughs> yeah. to Columbia. Sweet. That's so, good yeah, that it I, works out that way. Yeah, we don't have any details yet. Um, this is not the, the farthest out show that we've done. We actually did a show in April in Marietta, uh, which did not pay off promotion wasn't very good and there was like 10 people in the audience so we basically drove like an hour like basically three hours out to play to like uh like my friend's parents and like five other people <laughs> that's all right that, though but you rock those 10 yeah people. you rock that shit that's yeah yeah good. i mean that's that's another thing that happens a lot they say that uh, you're gonna you're gonna play to, to a lot of empty to a lot of empty audiences before you know you you play to a full one yeah, well, that's that's called music college. You know, you go out yeah. and you, you learn how to play for anybody, no matter what. So when you have a big crowd, it's just that much more fun, and, and you cut your teeth. So you guys are doing the right things. Oh yeah, that's good to hear. It, and if I can <laughs> tell you, uh, so, this is Kyle. I think it probably takes more courage to play in front of probably ten people than it probably would to play in front of a thousand. People. Hell yes, you're building up a whole different kind of resilience, man. It's easy to play in front of a thousand people. Ten people. Mm, that's a lot of pressure. Yeah, you get ten oh, people yeah. moving, and and then your mom and she's dancing. You, you're mo- you're making things happen. So that's a good thing. Except if it's my mom. <laughs> <laughs> don't make my mom. Don't make my mom. You got to break out the disco for your mom. So, you guys have quite a few shows booked already for the summer in and around where you're close by. And as you uh, go out to these shows, how are you packing your stuff up? I mean, does everybody show up with their own gear? Or do you guys have like one 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 motorhome that you got from Uncle Lou, and he's like, "Yeah, take the motorhome." And all your gear fits in one motorhome, and you hit the road in it. How do you guys do it? Uh, Dave has um, his his dad has what I call an old man van. Um, so um, what we do is when we we do those long distance things, um, he shows up, we pile our stuff in the back, and we we all ride in that van, that old man van. So I used to work at Mix Magazine. I don't even know if anybody reads Mix Magazine, anymore, but it's a magazine for sound engineers and producers. We had a uh, reference book section, and we'd sell all these books to, you know, colleges and universities.
universities all over the place. But one of the books that we'd sold to consumers a lot was called Book Your Own Tour. And it was a directory, and it had all the small, shitty clubs all across the country. So you could actually plan an entire summer around, you know, hitting the road and working your way west. And then there was a section of the book was like, that was, okay, how many people you have in your band is going to de- be determined by how many people you can fit in your van. And, and if you have an old man van, that's perfectly put, because they had the perfect plan for gutting the old man van and building shelves in it that could house all your stuff and you. And this book was a, an enormous hit. And all kinds of indie bands would buy this book, outfit their old man van, and then all hit the hit the road in one view. So thing that's about, awesome. You guys about figuring doing, it out yourselves. The thing about doing it like that, too, is, is you head out. You know, next thing you know, you're in Mobile, Alabama. And then you got to find a gig to the west. And then another gig to the west. It, what you learn is, is that you can find gigs and make enough money to get to the next town. And then you got to get back. But you know how to get back now. So you can go on these grand adventures when you guys go out and play, earn some money. Damn. Who doesn't want to rock like that? Yeah, no kidding. Uh, funny funny you actually say that is uh, on our last gig that we went on the Marietta one. Uh, driving back from Marietta, going back home to Augusta, we were talking about um, getting like a short bus and gutting all the seats out of it. Just making a little like mobile uh, gig van type deal. Yeah, there you go. And it's got to be fancy and decent prices are usually pretty good. So that's a good way oh, to yeah. go. Hey, when you guys are making music, I'm assuming you guys are writing your own stuff as well as doing covers? Oh, yeah. We um, actually started off doing a majority of originals. We usually only do one one or two covers per show. What cover is that your guys' thing right now? Like, you know, we're going to close the show with this cover because we know this thing kills. Well, what song is that song? Uh, we never actually close um, with a cover. We usually have a cover um, like towards the either beginning or the middle of the set. We always end with our song Calling Bull because that's our uh, hard hitter. Oh, right on. Nice. Oh, yeah, Way to end big. Is it good one, Brenda? Yeah, it's one of the ones she sent me. It's probably like a song I would go out of my way to go listen to. That's a great strategy, too, because when you're, u- when you're using a cover to get your, f- your familiarity with the crowd, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, I, I love this tune. And then they're into you. Mm-hmm. And then you can go from there and you can do your thing. And, man, that sounds great. You guys have figured out quite a lot in the amount of time that you've been together as a band. I guess it's a, I wouldn't quite call it trial and error. Uh, error. What I actually do is when I get bored, I Google stuff. And it's actually, you know, I find out a lot of this stuff, like uh, music promotion wise. Uh, I've gotten this on the radio uh, at a lot of small time colleges out in California and even a radio station um, in the UK just by looking up independent artists um, and radio stations looking for independent artists. So it, most bands. Hey, that band from Augusta did the same thing. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys know the big bands from Augusta at all? Are you guys familiar with that that whole Augusta scene or the uh, Athens scene, I should say? Uh, actually, not that much because um, we we haven't actually started playing that much until this upcoming summer. I'm Reverb Nation. If you've ever heard of it, I, I'm friends with a couple of um, people through that website. Uh, I have pr- actually a pretty big connection in Lexington. A Allison Chains cover group by the name of Grind. Their lead singer um, Gary. I'm pretty I'm I'm pretty tight with Gary. He messaged me every now and then, but um. He come, he's planning on coming to town at some point and hoping to get us in that show. And uh, I guess I, I guess we really don't have too many, uh, I guess, sort of connections in town because I haven't come across any. No one really ever reaches out to us. Um, that's why we haven't had much of a focus on Augusta. But just in general, Augusta produced uh, PV2s. Lady A. Lady A. Uh, uh, that one. Yeah, that's a big one. That's a big one. R.E.M. would be a big one. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So some of the biggest bands in rock in the last 50 years have come out of Athens. All you guys have to do is just keep doing what you're doing. You've already got one good banging song. You're going to have more of them. Then. Yeah, but my question I want to know is every band has that person who just seems to have a knack for knowing the music industry. And Hugh Lewis in the news, it was you. He had gone to the clubs early. He had learned the formula. Um, Aerosmith. Uh, Steven Tyler knew. He's like, hey, you open up, you kick it with a three song medley, you get the crowd going, you don't stop for the first 12 minutes. You know, he knew that just because of what he learned from rock and roll. Who's your guys as Steven Tyler in your band? Who knows the formula for setting up a set? Um, I'm, probably I mean, you, Marissa. Yeah, it's probably me. It's probably yeah. me. I don't like, I mean, I'm a pretty modest person. I don't want to say that, you know, like I'm the band, but 
I, I usually, the majority of our stuff I've written, all of the promotion I've done myself because it's just something that I get bored and I do. I organize as much as I can, but, you know, the other guys, like, Tame it helps out with the booking and the shows, which is great because I don't know actually that much about that. I don't know. I guess I, get, I, guess I am. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that, like, for as long as I've known Marissa and, like, as much as I know of her, from what I've noticed, she has been, like, musically talented, like, even in freshman math. I forget what, in, what instrument you had. I remember, like, one day you were just playing uh, Crazy Train, just like, like, it was no big deal. Like, you've known it since you were born. I don't remember what instrument it was, but on it was On the Glockenspiel. Really it was a mandolin. I brought a mandolin. Mandolin, that's what it was. That's right. Crazy Train on the mandolin. <laughs> Mr. Harris's class. So there you go. There's your, there's your unknown R.E.M. influence. Big on the mandolin in that band. And when I actually love R.E.M. I'm, I've always loved R.E.M. Oh, what's not to love? Yeah. Those guys are terrific. You know what? You, I was... I appreciate your humility, Marissa, but if Kyle didn't say it, I was going to say it because clearly you've put a lot of thought into into the set. And you know what happens with great bands is everybody finds the thing that they that they do well. And if you're lucky enough to have a diverse set of skills among among your bandmates and everybody does something different to contribute, man, that's that's a lucky mix right there. I would say that we're a very different, we're a very similar group of people, and even though Kyle has only been with us for, like, I guess a few weeks now, actually, it's, everything just sort of is, is falling into place. Like, he's missing piece of the puzzle, and uh, after we, we got tame in, it was just, we just kept filling in all of these spots and becoming a better, uh, more solid group. And everything just started sounding better. And um, because everyone brings something different to the table, we have the opportunity to make different sounding music that isn't repetitive, that doesn't sound the same. Like as much as I like ACDC and, and like Rage Against the Machine, uh, they're they're always going to make pretty much the same sounding album. And like because of our influences, we're making different sounding songs that still sound good and have a uniqueness to them that they all have in common. But they're still on their own, and they still have something different that can appeal to even multiple genres. Yeah, that's cool that you guys are starting to find your voice because ACDC, what they do, they do the well. They do very well. No one can do that better. They, they can come in and literally play the same set every night, 30 different stadiums around the nation and play stadiums. But not every band can do that. Not every band has that magic formula where they can just play the same, you know, same three chords, same basic Well, they've also structure. been doing it so long that that's all we want years. from them. Yeah, that's exactly. You know, if they decided to branch out and, want, and you know... If, if we had to, if Angus said, "Hey, you know what? I really, I really love Bossa Novas. Yeah. I've really gotten into Bossa Novas lately." We'd be like, "All right, that's great. Cut it out. Yeah, cut it out, Angus." Right. However, you guys are carving a path that involves a lot more diversity, a lot more uh, musical stylings from all over the place. So. Yeah, we've heard of funk. We've heard '90s rock. We've heard '70s rock. Yeah. '80s rock, and plenty of it, and plenty, and of good it. shit. Who Van Halen? Yeah, yeah, those are good places to draw from. Definitely. I honestly had every intention of getting on here and just challenging you guys as far as you are, you know, to challenging you guys to see how far out you could reach in terms of your influences. And I'm like, Ooh, okay, well, <laughs> there goes that. So, so yeah, let, let's let's go a little left though. How about Fishbone? You guys got any Fishbone love in your uh, in your music? Uh, not not here, not on my end. All right. Oh, uh, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> I'm yeah. I, I always, you know, you guys do what you guys got to do. You guys know your voice much better than I do, but you can never go wrong by adding a horn or two in your music. You really want to punch things up. Or not, ready. but check out Fishbone because they're cool yeah. and they're funny as hell. Yeah. And, you know, they're a great party band and they're a great band for, for hard rocking good times, especially in college environments. Yeah. If you want to learn college music, learn how to do what Fishbone did, if that's possible. Plus, a lot of the bands that you guys are saying you're into are the bands where you're going to walk into a place and there's going to be somebody wearing the t-shirt and you're going to have the secret knot where you're like, yeah, I don't know what you're up to. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's what makes those bands great. Yeah, and, yeah uh, exactly. And Fishbone's one of those bands. I think you just haven't gotten to them yet. If Taman was to put on a Fishbone shirt, instant 10 extra cool points and a few extra ladies' eyes going, who's that Ooh. guy? <laughs> yeah. I get subliminal. You know, it's just that their their logo is iconic. Plus, there's three different kinds of crazy in their band. Oh man, yeah. So that's always fun too. Speaking of uh, crazy, I'm actually a huge fan of Primus. Um, yes, there we go. <laughs> yes, Liz Claypool, yeah. I'm back. Liz Claypool is 
He's an he's an incredible bassist, and I wish I could do what he can do, but I can't. <laughs> I don't that, think anyone can. That's that's big though. I mean, that's you know, Eric Clapton says the same thing about Robert Johnson, and you always got to have someone that's out in front of you that pushes you to be the better you that you are. You right. Know? That's and, and sometimes you ask that person like, "Man, did you realize you were?" Cre-? And they look at you like, "I did uh, no, come on, man." Yeah. I'm just trying to be as good as, as this guy. Yeah. You know? I, I didn't, I, I didn't do anything. And if Les Playpool is your out in front of you person, you, you yeah, can't go wrong. Yeah, there. Right. Yeah. So wait a minute. Cause I didn't put the pieces together. Marissa, you play the bass? Yeah. I play bass and I, and I sing. Um, okay. but I guess for the bass, my, I, I guess Les, Les Playpool is like, I wouldn't say my main influence, but like, I guess my bass idol, Chris Cornell is my hero in general. I love Chris Cornell to death. And like vocally, like I, I will sit in the car and like listen to like their second album, Bad Motor, Motor Finger, and like try to hit those notes and like try <laughs> to understand how to belt like that. And I slowly, little by little, like I'm, I'm picking that up. Like I can't be Chris Cornell and I'm not trying to be, but like that man challenges my vocal range to death. You know, that's terrific because when you have somebody who's clearly not you, I mean, I can't say, oh, yeah, that, you know, when I listen to Marissa play, she sounds just like she's in Soundgarden, you know. That's kind of not the point. When you have an influence, the great thing is somebody's taken a different path than you. But when you find something in that person's playing that kind of spurs you on, that's terrific. And uh, I think chicks who play the bass are awesome because <laughs> a female sensibility on the bass yeah. is just Oh, man. I mean, there's so many awesome female bass players. Rhonda Smith from Prince's Band. She's amazing. Tall Wilkenfeld. Are you familiar with Tall Wilkenfeld? Uh, I, don't, I don't believe so, no. Crazy. Crazy. And, you know. Oh, it, yeah, yeah. I know her. I think that, I think that we have, so, it's such a rare thing to find a woman embrace the bass. I don't know why. Because for some reason, I think, for the same reason that I, I don't know. I mean, I like I like tough chicks in movies. All right, and I think the tough chick in the movie is is the same as the chick who would go, "I'll play the bass." And like, ooh, okay, all right. The bass is a sexy instrument. And it, it requires a, some courage, and it requires some some yeah, some courage. And it it is a manly instrument. It's a big instrument. You know, it is cool when a woman can bring her side to that because you're like, you see this big old long neck. You know, heavy or guitar thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how it wouldn't play. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's a different approach. Yeah, but not only that, it's it's not exactly a woman's industry. Um, music just it hasn't been, even though you see a lot of female icons in pop, like Beyonce and all those other people. It, it's just um, it's an industry where you don't see a lot of women. And on the other hand, um, one of the things that I like about our band is we're physically or in racially a diverse group because um Taman Taman is is mixed he's black and his mom is white and so and I'm a woman so we're representing two minorities that are so poorly represented in this industry and for me that's just like I, I feel like I can relate to other people like I was a kid who a girl who grew up with a lot of male influences white male influences and like I never saw myself in anyone else and I don't know about you Taman but I mean like it, it's it's hard to want to be there and not see anybody who resembles you up there and to feel so like um, underrepresented, underrepresented in that industry. It's kind of a sad thing, uh, and it's just another one of those things our I guess our country and maybe even you know the world industry struggles from. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like my whole thing is like whenever I used to watch a lot of drummers coming up, I'd always see like a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. A lot. It's not ca- Caucasian drummers, and there's all, obviously lots of black drummers out there, but I just wanted to, you know, make a staple in it, you know, being a minority and just, you know, play drums. You know? That's terrific. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, your ability to grasp not only the social commentary that exists in what you just said and, you know, to be able to verbalize them in a way that you clearly seek to overcome it is going to bring other people, you know, is going to bring other people to you. And then is going to have other people take your example and go, yeah, you know what? It's okay to be whatever I don't see enough of. I'm going to charge out there. I'm going to try and grab as much influence from other people as I can, but I'm going to charge out there and be unafraid. Yeah, that's part of your guys' voice. And so a guy from our area here in California who's basically 
We like to say he's the icon that was copied by the icons who copied the icons who copied the icons. He he is the root spark. His name's Sly Stone. If you guys know who Sly Stone is, and he is his band started in the late sixties, and it was integrated, and so we're still cutting that path today. But it takes bands like that. It takes bands like you guys that say, "Look, here's here's a mixed drummer, here's a female lead singer who plays bass." If Sly had. He had every color he could get. He wanted hippies in his band. He wanted everybody he could get out there to represent people. Yeah, he was a black guy. Mm-hmm. His sister was in the band. His cousin was in the band. They had an Italian drummer. They had a female trumpet player. They had a Mexican guitar player. They, I mean, they had everybody. And then they, and it was sort of by coincidence because he really did go out and go after the best player of whatever he was trying to get but when it started to come together he said no you know what we really can make a statement here doing this and it matters and it did and it still does so you guys keep up that good work yeah the roots of what you guys do go back that far and and are that deep so you you're on the right path with those kind of things because for sure if you're feeling that your peers are feeling the same thing they want to see you know, like uh, it was a big deal when we were younger that the lead singer from the Divinals was a female and she sang about masturbation. That ain't shit. You know, that's yeah. that, that ground got cut, trampled over, and we moved further afield than that. So if there's, if you guys feel there's space out there, you're right. Go go uh, go find that space and play in it. it. Well, ultimately, my goal is I play music one because it makes me happy and I get I get the thrill of being up on stage. But ultimately, looking at it, it's just I I want. I don't want someone to necessarily hear my story. I just want to connect with people through my experiences, through my music. So in a way they don't feel alone or just to help explain that emotion through my own words. So when you guys write songs, what, what place do you guys go to then? If you're not trying to tell your story, how deep do you get? Where does, where does your muse come from? And do you even know yet? I've done a lot of, a lot of thinking about that. I, I pretty much do most, if not, if not all of the vocal and uh, lyrical work. And a lot of it comes from, um, just me comprehending emotional feelings that I have towards things like um, the most of our hard hitters are about like relationships that I've gone through just because it's an easy thing to write about. A lot of the stuff that I don't exactly share through the band actually is about how I battled through depression since I was a kid. Um, it's just understanding how I feel in my emotions and just sitting there with a guitar or a bass and playing something and just saying whatever comes to mind. But one, one day, you know, if we can get it big, I, I want, I just want to be able to connect to someone through that to give some sort of support or closure that I didn't get. I think you guys are going to connect with a lot of someone's. I mean, that's a message that, that means something to a lot of people. And it sounds like you guys are, uh, wow. I'm, I'm kind of blown away yeah. that you guys have uh, so much to say uh, so early on in your, in your band's path and so much to say that is of some consequence. That's really cool. Music is, um, it's an expression and it's a way of communicating and going back to, I guess, the diversity stuff, it's something that isn't just unique to, I guess, alt rock these days is just full of a bunch of skinny white boys <laughs> when you think about it, but it's just, it's communication. Um, music is, is blind. It's, it's full of self-expression. It's just a raw emotion, a raw median for just connecting with other people and sharing experiences. And that's what music has always been about. Agreed. Yeah, no kid. I love Prince. Anybody your age still love Prince? Oh, everyone loves Prince. Oh, yeah. 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 I just played Let's Go Crazy last night. Wow. That's a good song to play. I like the song Manic Monday. Do you like Manic Monday? (laughs) Yeah, I didn't know he wrote that, actually. Yeah. Well, it was a band with four good-looking chicks, and he was trying to get after probably all four of them, so... He probably got all four of them. From that standpoint, it makes a little more sense, but... Yeah, that that song always, there was a particular, I grew up listening to Prince, so I remember like his chronology, and I remember when he was writing songs that sounded like that, and when you hear girls sing that song, I think, man, they sang, they did a spectacular job with that song, but it still does sound like a Prince song to me, because it's, you know, it's got that little trill in it, and it's got just a melodic thing that he was doing a lot of right then. He wrote that around the time that he had had an album out called Around the World in a Day. And if you listen to that album, you'll go, oh yeah, he wrote Manic Monday. I think Manic Monday would make a great punk song. 
It would. Two minutes, 20 seconds. Done. You know who should get a hold of Manic Monday is me first in the Gimme Gimmies. Okay. I was going to say DRI, but whatever. As long yeah. as it's fast. <laughs> if they, they, they got a hold of that song, they'd do a great job. 490 beats per minute. You know, yeah. Just crank that thing out. And that's exactly the kind of song you need for that. So what do you guys think is going to happen to the music business in the years to come? I mean, it seems like you guys have a very pragmatic view of the fact that nobody's making money selling records anymore. Um, Something's going to change. Something's <laughs> definitely about to change. I'd say if you look at like music history for the past, from the past like even hundred years, uh, there's like a cycle, like a 20, 30 year cycle where just someone comes along and just blows shit up and just everything gets just turned upside down in its head. We're at the point right now, kind of like in the 80s with the hair metal bands, where everybody sounds the same. Everybody is doing the same thing. And something, something is bound to happen. And another thing is with the rise of the internet and all the downloads, um, free downloads you do, like Band Bandcamp, uh, all the musicians on YouTube. It's, at some point, some kid is going to make some pop song. It's going to be a hit. And we'll make millions and millions of dollars without ever having to sign a contract because all these... um all these labor labels are starting to become obsolete because who needs labels and distributors if you have the internet, if you can do it all by yourself. I thought, I might be wrong about this, but I thought I heard Chance the Rapper is unsigned. And he's, that might, I don't know. Yeah, that and might he's going crazy. crazy. Yeah. Well, the other thing you have to do is you have to find other ways to make money. Yeah. You know, because you're not going to make them sell on albums. That doesn't mean there's not other ways to do it. Yeah. Maybe you do subscription concerts. Maybe you, you know, sell shoes. I mean, Rappers are great at cross marketing and selling everything. Yeah, I mean Puffy is out of the music business because he sold so much vodka he had to go. Yeah, you know. So there's there's a lot of other ways to do it. It's just like you said, it goes in cycles. Different things happen, and uh, that's a trip though out. that you bring up what happens in the music business every thirty years for the last hundred because we really have only been buying recorded music for the last sixty. Yeah, right. You know. So to have like a hundred year view of music, that is a much more, I think, artistic view. Yeah. It's, you know? it's, it's the evolution, um, in the development of genres. Like yeah. you had, you had jazz, um, then you had blues and blues broke off into rock and then rock broke off into all these subgenres. Everything just sort of came from, I'd say like a 1910s area. So yeah, uh, here's why I bring that up. Because, Marissa, you're looking at music and the cycles of the creative process. And I'm just thinking, like, man, what's a brother got to do to eat? Yeah. You know? And if we're not selling recorded music anymore, th this is just my thinking as I asked that question. My thinking was, we're not selling music that way anymore, recorded music. Then somebody's going to have to change the paradigm for where where profit exists right and and where revenue exists for an artist and your thinking just blew my thinking out of the water yeah cuz you were like no 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 because every 30 years somebody comes along and goes nope that's not how you do that's not how you create music that's not how you grab people by the heart and move them and, and if we know anything about the record industry when people made a lot of money who always made money were the record companies, either through bad contracts or bad, bad accounting of, of numbers of sales. We, we've heard uh, we guys from Guns N' Roses say we sold way more albums than they were, they were accounted for. Yeah. But at some point, you just can't fight that fight anymore. It costs you too much. The money you get back is insignificant to what you spent. So the record industry thing was going to die. And I guess where I'm going to go ultimately with this is there's a guy named Dr. Robert Greenberg who's been a guest on our show. And that guy's a music historian. And if you can go back 250 years, you'll see a pattern, I'm sure, where you guys will say, well, here's what's going to come around now. There used to be benefactors, funded music, and then subscription concerts started to go around. Uh, there were things like opera that started to break out. And people got paid a lot of money to write one big piece of music. And it just kept evolving and all these different things. So it could be that there's a, a different marketplace that is going to return back to the present because it's its time. But I think if we look really closely at those marketplace changes, they're probably driven by what Marissa's talking about. Like there oh, was sure. some Psych creative genius who showed up and went, this thing, this no. is my thing. I call it opera. And I'm not going to sell it that way. Right. I'm going to sell it this way. This is how this yeah. is how I want people to come see it. And and so that's what's going to change it. The artistry is going to change it, not the For industry. Sure. No, not the industry at all. No, but there are patterns in the industry, like she was saying, that maybe there is a spark in that. You know, it's like, hey, this has not been tried for a while. You try to find your way. 
And ultimately, if you're way, so back to fishbone. If you don't make a lot of money, you make the artistic choice your whole life. Yeah, you're never going to have a whole lot of money. But damn, you're going to live an artistic life and get to express and yourself. And it's going to be great. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Kyle. Hey. What kind of guitar are you playing? Right now, I'm playing LTD. All right. ESP. Wow. Right on. Tamin, what kind yeah. of drums are you playing? I play a Pearl Export with Zildjian Cymbal. Right on. That is the young touring yes. drummer's drum set right yes, there. Yes, it is. I had Pearl Exports when I was about your age, and uh, that was about 2,000 years ago. That was when Pearl Exports came out. Are you rocking a gong? Uh, Are uh, you rocking uh, a gong? No? No. Uh, no. no. Somebody who's got Pearl Exports can't afford a gong. Well, you might have, you know, there might be like a second-hand gong you found out like a, you know, on Craigslist. It's called a trash can. <laughs> <laughs> a trash How about you, Marissa? What kind of axe you grinding over there? I got two bases I use. I got a, um, I got a Fender P bass. Uh, that I usually play live with because that thing's light and I can fling it around and hit it whatever works. <laughs> uh, and then I have a um, jazz bass that I made for my senior project in high school, made out of black green wood. And the thing is oh. so beautiful; it sounds gorgeous. But the problem is it weighs so much. Yeah, you, know, you can get a bad know. back hauling that no, thing yeah. around. <laughs> I, I got the little gel, little gel thing you put on the strap. Yeah, doesn't do much though. You, but you had to get the gel thing. Yeah. So that's the base that you're going to make records on while you're sitting on a stool. <laughs> and so is your, it shows your base, yeah. I, I've built up a tolerance to the pain to the point where I, I usually practice with it, but when it comes to playing shows, I bring out the P bass because yeah. it's, just, it's just better to. Plus, the, the, the my jazz bass, like, I, I think is my baby. Like, I made that. Yeah. It's made out of some expensive wood, and, like, God forbid something bad happened. To that's that. pretty amazing that you built that thing. Yeah. You guys are advanced. Let me ask Damn. you this, too. When you're playing live, I imagine that when you're playing live, your energy level is up, especially if, you know, you're rocking, the crowd's with you and all that stuff. Does it help to loosen your motor skills a little bit playing the P bass because your strings are slightly further apart? Um, like, is that better? Is it, is it a, is it a bigger, um, uh, margin for error? It is a bigger margin for error. Um, that I can definitely, I feel like I can perform better on my jazz bass, but um, when it comes to just playing uh, live, I prefer a lighter bass because it's just one, it's easier on my back, and two, I can I can fling it around. It can take more abuse that I'm comfortable with. Right on, the beater, <laughs> the gamer. Brandon, what's your favorite thing about Blooms? When I was listening to one of the shows or one of the songs or both of the songs, I should say that they sent me. Um, the Calling Bowl. I think that one, that one, like you could tell, like you hear like the different influences that from the different bands that they've heard of. You can just hear it all in one song. Like, I couldn't tell what band really that it sounded like, but it sounded like something that they were talking about. That's cool. So like you heard the multiple influences kind of coming together. Yeah, like they like, were channeling it all into the right, sound. Instead of a potato, a hunk of meat, and a carrot, you, yeah. you heard stew, and, it, and it, you like. I know you like stew and goulash. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> If you talk in terms of food, you'll get Brenda's attention, that's for yes. sure. And earlier, Marissa, so you were saying, like, the band, like, your band has changed, like, and I know how, like, it's changed with, like, different members, but would you say that since you started, has, like, your musical outlook on it, or, like, your music or voice has changed in general, or is it kind of mostly stay the same? I wouldn't, it doesn't, it doesn't exactly change, it just keeps getting better, it's just, like, like a tree root growing up and branching off and just becoming like, stronger. Okay. All right. That was my main question for right now. <laughs> oh, we were talking about like the different obstacles earlier about being a female bass player who's also the me, like the lead singer. And then we have Taman who's a mixed drum player. Would you say that those obstacles are going to be like still kind of hard to get over if you were to continue into music or is it going to be like, easier to do than it was 30 years ago. I don't think it's an obstacle at all. If anything, I think it's an advantage because we can appeal to different people. It's no longer just, say, this band is made of a bunch of skinny white dudes with jet black hair and a bunch of tattoos. It's, hey, this is this looks like a bunch of people I would hang out with at school. Or yeah. At work. You do wear black t-shirts, though. Please tell me you wear black t-shirts because you got to wear black t-shirts. <laughs> hey, watch out making the comments about the skinny white dudes. We all need some love too, you know. <laughs> skinny white dude. Well, yeah. I'm, a, I'm speaking for the former skinny white dude that used to live in my body. <laughs> now I'm more dad shaped. 
So I dig what you guys do. Uh, I'm dying to know when you guys are going to get out on the road and, and venture outside of the uh, southeast. When, when are you coming to California? Uh, I don't know. It's a good question. I guess when we have uh, more funds and uh, time to. Nice. Do you guys have other markets targeted? Are you trying to break into the Florida market or anything like that? Are you going to go north and go to Virginia? What, what are you thinking? Um, right now, my goal is to take Augusta, uh, I guess, sort of by the balls, metaphorically speaking. We want to have a larger presence here and then move on. Um, the music scene right now in Florida is actually pretty good, so I'm hoping to at some point make it down to Jacksonville because a lot of a lot of good stuff is apparently going going on down there. When you guys are ready to go to Jacksonville, let me know. I've got a nice, soft, warm landing spot for you. It's my buddy Night Train, and he's a bad motherfucker, and he plays the bass, and his thumb is stinky. I mean, he's all over it. So when you guys are ready to do that, he can get you hooked up with some of the clubs that they play down there. And they're, they're, they're a cover band, but they play a lot of really good places. So uh, we're, any way the Break It Down show can support you guys, we would gladly do so because we love what you guys are doing. We love where you're coming from. Well, we really appreciate it. And I just wanted to let you know real quick, all our um, album continue is completely free on Bandcamp, um, free for everyone to download. Uh, we don't charge for any of our music. Uh, the only thing we charge for is our, uh, like, merch, T-shirts, buttons, whatnot. That's fantastic. Okay, so so hit us with some of your social media stuff. Give us the whole thing again. Bandcamp, all those things, Twitter. Where where can we find Bull Moose? Twitter, Bandcamp, Reverb Nation, Facebook. There's this um, website called NumberOneMusic.com that we're doing pretty, pretty well on. We're on YouTube. Uh, I think that's probably about it. And we just look up the word Bull Moose and we find you guys? Pretty much. If you type in uh, Bullmoose411, I think for some reason I just use that tag for a lot of our stuff. I think you'll at least get the Twitter account and the YouTube account. Any other questions, John, before we go? No, I had to pop off for a second because the call came in for our next guest. But uh, but I'm excited to listen to you guys. I think you guys are terrific. I think you're interesting, and I think you have a great narrative behind you that needs to be heard, and I can't wait to listen to your stuff. Uh, we really appreciate you guys having us on, and Brenna, I really appreciate this. Like, Yeah, no problem. Yeah. 